to Let's Talk Assassin's Creed, your number one podcast for all things Assassin's Creed. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to episode 121 of Let's Talk Assassin's Creed. Um, Declan, I'm going to start with a little phrase and see if you know the next line. Um, if I was to say to you, Salute Claudia, how would you respond? I forgot. <laughs> Well, in that case, we've got to welcome our guest and see if she knows the next line. So welcome to the show, uh, special guest, uh, Sophia. Buonasera, hello. And uh, thank you for having buonasera. me. I unfortunately am also not certain what the next line is. <laughs> well, now, see, now, knowing that you two are the pros, which we'll get to in a second, I'm worried that I'm going mad. When when uh, Ezio returns to, to Monte Regione, to the villa, and he meets Claudia, who is running the business, and he always, the little interaction they have is, uh, he says, salute Claudia, and she says, you here to look at the book? Right. But, ah, uh, I've heard that line so many times when I've played Assassin's Creed 2 that it's burned into my head. It's the it's the only line that is, I know that everyone talks about, it's a good life we lead, brother, and, and that's a great sequence as well on the rooftops, but for me, it's always that <laughs> voice, salute Claudia, that's always stuck in my head. Anyway. So you might have guessed, everyone, that we're talking about Assassin's Creed 2 tonight. Um, because, Declan, you've been replaying it. Well, you started replaying it, I suppose, just after Christmas. For the first time in how many years? 13 years. I hate saying that. 13 <laughs> years. I started the franchise at 12. Two years later, I'm playing Assassin's Creed 2. Now I'm 26, replaying them all. I'm me, old. But you are you are getting old, very old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. My knees and you, don't Sophia, work. you you grew up as well yeah, playing yeah, the games. Yeah, it's been a it's been a hard minute. Uh, I was just uh, reminiscing <laughs> that yeah, the first time I played the EC2, I was ten, I think. So I'm twenty two now. Uh, so it's been a, it's been a second. <laughs> babies, babies. <laughs> Where should we start? So Declan, what's it like to go back? So you, we should say, first of all, you're playing the collect the, the remastered collection on Xbox. Um, what's it like going back? I really know I'm going to get in trouble for this, but I don't see what the hype is. They go, shoot me down. Like, Ooh. I'm enjoying my time and I have no complaints. It's as fantastic as it was when I first played in 2009. My issue is, what made Ezio so popular like every time there's a legacy outfit it's always let's start with Ezio let's start with Ezio let's do Ezio let's do Ezio and it's like I'm playing it as has his career too and I'm like yeah he's a cool guy but what why is he so popular like why is Ubisoft marking everything as Ezio kind of doesn't I don't see the hype anymore if that makes sense <laughs> interesting <laughs> what do you well, think Sophia um Okay, there's two ways that I could go about this. Which which opinion do you want? The opinion of somebody who has spent years analyzing literature and, you know, uh, characters and can actually do this professionally? Or the opinion of somebody who is named Sophia and has been pretending to be Ezio's wife for the past decade? Can we <laughs> okay. have both? Both sound good. <laughs> well, um, okay, so I think... Objectively, I think what made Ezio so popular is the fact that he he's a Mary Sue. Like, I don't know if there's a male version of a Mary Sue, but if there is one, that would probably be Ezio. And I think he, he got so popular because he he is a perfect fantasy for, a, you know, a specific range of people. Like, I, I'm, I'm not a guy, so I'm, I'm going off of what I've been told. But, you know, you get this guy, he's young, um, he's living the good life, good looking, rich. Yep. Good looking guy. Um, yep. Suddenly, you know, everything goes south, but, you know, he, he doesn't give up. He becomes his own hero. He just, you know, um, fights back. And in fighting back, everything kind of goes his way because in AC2, nothing really, you know, Apart from the beginning and a few things here and there, things kind of go how they're supposed to. And in the meantime, Ezio gets all the ladies, he's super charming, you know, uh, meets a bunch of cool people. So, you know, he's the guy you want to be, in a way. And I think that there's no reason why somebody, you know, should be like, oh yeah, 
uh, I, I would never be like Ezio. So I think that's what made him popular in general, at least. So he's he's the male fantasy for the male player, would you say? Or actually for any player who wants to be charming and attractive? And I think, yeah, I think it's, it's probably more... Um, he probably comes off as more attractive to a male audience. Uh, but, that, you know, I think anybody uh, to some degree would like to be like Ezio. God knows I do. <laughs> mm. Mm. It, it's kind of odd that I'm more of a guy who preferred to be like Altair. I, I love his take on philosophy. I love how his mind works. And I like how he started off as a brash idiot who broke the tenants and then grew into his own person who would forever change the assassins for the good way. So maybe I'm just a bit weird. I like it too. I think he's a cool guy, but you know, I prefer my Altair robes. I prefer Altair. I mean, yeah. I mean, <laughs> That's it makes my kind sense, of guy. definitely. Um, I, I mean, as the kind, as if, you know, the characters were real, I would probably get more along with an Altair more than with an Ezio as well. But, um, I think, yeah, I think for some people, maybe that's, that's not it. Maybe they just want to be the cool guy that gets the ladies. Uh, but for other people, uh, I think it's also the fact that Ezio is, apart from, you know, getting everything he wants and being a ladies man, which is not. Uh, I mean, it can be realistic, but also cannot be, depending on. Um, but I think, uh, in a way, he's very, very realistic. Like, <laughs> this is this is kind of hard to explain, but as somebody, I, I say this as somebody who loves the character. The most realistic thing about Ezio, he is that he's just dumb. He is in. <laughs> Yes. Did you say dumb? He's a hundred percent stupid. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Love it. Okay. And uh, I, I'm saying that because you know, in in the first game, obviously he's young, he's immature. Uh, he has a lot of growing up to do, and you can kind of see it throughout the game. Like you can see that he becomes more thoughtful. He becomes more, um, more uh, less brash, or you know, just doesn't rush into things straight away in some parts. You can kind of see some character development, but also, you know, mm. as you, I, I don't know if we can call it spoilers, but as you can see in Brotherhood, he's not that developed. Like, he, do, he hasn't fixed all of his issues. He is still, again, pretty dumb. And maybe that's just him. But that's also, at least for me, the way I always saw it is that that's very realistic. Like, of all the people I've met, there was nobody in their 40s or even their 50s who actually had it together. They tried. They sure tried. <laughs> I think as you get older, you get better at hiding exactly. your, your dumbness. Exactly. <laughs> and <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know, the fact that you can still see that in Ezio, he's just, you know, trying to grow succeeding in some parts failing in others and you know just trying again and again i just thought that made him very realistic and may maybe that's part of why he's popular as well yeah it probably also helps declan that he had three games and no other character has they're they're there you have a game with them and then you move on and that that probably helps cement him more into the franchise and into people's consciousness. And we see him, I mean, right at the start of Assassin's Creed, I've only, see, I've only played Assassin's Creed 2 once, and I don't remember it that well. So I'm probably not going to have much to say tonight, maybe just more questions. But that opening scene where you're kicking his legs as a baby to breathe life into him. And, well, in fact, if you include um, lineage, you see his father and his family before he arrives. And you see him as a baby, him as a young man, him as a, an older, middle-aged man. And then in Revelations, him as an older man. And then in Embers, we see the end of his life and his young family. You, he's the only character that we have, really, where you get the full birth, life, death story. And it's pretty awesome. And I wish we had more of it, to be honest. But that, maybe that's one of the other reasons as well. Can I just say the whole baby scene is the weirdest quick time event I've ever seen in <laughs> history? It is, 
But don't you think it's cool? So, <laughs> no. Like, oh. I know objectively, but when... I think it's know, awesome. I have, I'm gonna, I have words here, my friend. You say your point, then I'm going to come right back at you. Sophia's just probably thinking, what am I joining? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> this, this is great. This, this is got great. Beef. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, when I first played in 2009, I was like, okay, this is weird. Why am I wiggling babies' hands and feet? You know, this is... I didn't understand it. And then now replaying it, I was just kind of like, can we just skip this? I want to get to the part where, you know, I see him like being that tomboy throwing rocks and then getting chased out of a window and then boom, is he journey. I didn't want to be like, kick left leg, kick right leg, kick, <laughs> breathe. It's like, why? Mate, I don't see him again. That, that, that little sequence is genius. And I'll tell you why. Playing the newer games first, where the controls are very much more simple. I mean, I'm on PC, so it's WASD or left stick if you're on a controller and it's shift for high profile or to run or to parkour and that's it. Or it's, it's WASD and probably right trigger. I don't know. Anyway, it's very simple on the newer games. But when you go back to the older games with the, with the original puppeteer system, I have to say that's quite a mental leap for my simple brain. You know, the legs, everything to do with the legs is spacebar. Everything to do with the head is E or for interact and so on and so on. And actually, when you start to, when it starts to sink into your brain, the puppeteer system is genius because anything that you would naturally do with your arm, uh, your left arm or your, 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 what do they call it? Your unarmed, unarmed, unarmed hand or your open hand is, is this button. Anything with your armed hand is this button over here. Actually, because of that consistency, it's a genius control system, but because it's a bit unusual, I think that baby scene, because you've got to have tutorials on, on how to start the game and control the character, I think it's amazing because the tutorial, first of all, is telling you these are the these are the different parts of the human body that you are controlling um, and you are seeing it on the screen and you're introducing the character. I, think, I thought it was genius. So there you are. Uh, if you're listening to this, there's, there's two opinions, totally opposite. Take which one you like. What I do you think, I completely agree. Sophia? And I am ashamed to admit... That I was not paying when when I first started play, playing AC, I did not pay a lot of attention to detail, so that kind of slipped past me, because I I was playing on controller and it should have been even more obvious because you know triangle is mm. the top button and that's for the head movements, uh, X is the bottom button and you use that for you know the legs, but for some reason it never hit that that was a a tutorial on how the game was gonna work so i think i only realized that into my 10th playthrough <laughs> <laughs> 10 times whoa whoa let me stop you there yeah. 10 times and and that wasn't the last of it. amazing <laughs> <laughs> we so we had on um i'm thinking back i mean we discussed this on our live stream a couple of weeks ago and because she joined us, but she also joined us for one of our Unity episodes back in October. So White Wolf Whispers has played through Unity 100%, I think, four times. And Black Flag, probably that many times. But you're telling me that you've played through Assassin's Creed 2. Go on, how many times? Okay, um, the th <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah, we're strapping I for this. Ready. I lost count. But I do have a method of more or less knowing, you know, having a general idea. And that is from 2010 up until, uh, I think, 2019, I played, on average, um, AC2 twice a year. But then again, yeah, then again, wow. on the worst years, uh, I would restart it over and over again, you know, just to get, to pick up my own mood. So I believe... Mm, yeah. Uh, now it's maybe 15, 16, more or less. Do you know, I'm so glad that Servalan uh, gave, gave me the tip when we were setting up this episode and planning it last week. We wanted to talk about AC2 because Declan is replaying it right now and kind of wanted to get his, his impressions like he's giving us. And um, I knew Servalan had just finished playing it. Servalan was a guest with us again back in October last year. And I knew she'd just finished AC2 last week and I thought, great, she'll be fresh. She can join us and her and Declan can have geeky talks about AC2. And she said, actually, I know someone who knows this game better than anybody else. And she suggested you and I'm very glad she did because clearly we've got the right person. Go on, Declan. 
I'm just listening and I'm just like, I, I'm weird. I'm going to admit that straight away. I'm odd. I've never multiplied, multiplayed an Assassin's Creed game to date. I don't, I struggle with it. <clears throat> and I don't know how people are able to like replay games over and over again. It's it's cool because more than likely they're going to find stuff I totally blundered past. Like, I learned today that that BBC may have been a tutorial. I never clicked onto that. <laughs> and I'm only learning on the show. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I did one playthrough of um, AC2 back in 2009. Then I went back to AC1 for a little bit because that's all I could play. And then Brotherhood came out. And I think that yearly cycle kind of stopped me wanting to replay the games because as soon as you managed to get AC2 done, Brotherhood was out. Then Revelations, then free. But it's quite fascinating when I hear that people are able to play it like tons of times. I wonder if it helps you find more lore that you may have missed the first playthrough. I mean, it definitely helps you notice new details that you may have missed the first times. Like, um, uh, Civilons also helped me figure out in AC1, which I also played not that many times, but maybe two or three. Uh, I never knew Altair had the journal, for example. And uh, I think it shows up if you go into the memory logs. Sorry, you may have to say that again, Sophia. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I'm not... Again, I don't remember exactly where that is. Uh, but you know you have the... Yeah, in the memory wow. logs, there's... Um, apparently, you know, s small thoughts that Altair had about the the missions that he was doing and it only shows up from the animus if you if you go and check the specific memory or the memory block and i never knew that because the first time i was just you know traveling back and forth trying to see who i had to kill uh and what uh, what Anwalib wanted so i think yeah replaying the games definitely gives you uh, more insight into the details and also like it depends on the kind of replay you're going for for me for me ac2 was always a comfort game so whenever something would even you know just some something small uh but whenever something would go wrong in my life um i would just start ac2 know what i was gonna find and also it's a pretty short game so you can just, you know, replay it and Im immerse yourself in something that you know very well. Uh, and just, you know, either roam, do the missions, uh, or just even just stare at the canal for five hours. But it's something that, you know, it can be, you know, home in a little bit. I understand that, actually. And it's a very different game, of course. But for me, it's the same feeling I have with with the games that i've i suppose connected with the most from this series in fact so which, which would be odyssey and unity but been replaying and, and completing black flag over the last two weeks um and just going back to it every day to do a to replay a mission here or there to get the the 100 sync or to complete an assassin contract i think once you get into that groove of how the game works you don't need to think do you because it's automatic so it's you're right it's kind of comforting and it's What's the right word? I don't know. It's you can turn your brain off, I suppose, and just just chill and enjoy it. Um, so I, I can definitely understand that. I mean, Declan, Odyssey is a huge game, and I've played through that main story five times, I think, because I just love five it. Five times. <laughs> you know, I've replayed all the. I know, not 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 like hundred percent every location. I've, I've done that twice. That's enough. But I've played through the main story. Yeah, I think five times, um, just because. I, I totally fell in love with that game. But similarly for, for Unity, I've replayed every memory sequence probably, I don't know, six or seven times, just just partly to, to get the completion point of view, but partly just because I love playing it. Um, yeah, but you get into a groove, don't you? Where, like you say, you know where the characters are going to be and you know which roof you need to jump on and it's um, it's satisfying, yeah. I think a part of me, and it kind of leads on to the next point, and I know, again, I'm bringing up stuff that people are going to say, well, I should not be complaining, but when, the reason why I don't like 
multiple, multiple doing tons of replay routes of like the older games compared to the pre Unity games is I have a struggle mentally wanting to redo stories I already know because my brain already can run five missions ahead so it already plans a story out and it kind of makes me hard to keep focused on the story. So it leads to this issue with how the worlds have, were built, especially with AC2, where you can't accept, um, access certain points in the map until you do memories. They're restricted. And to me, I know it's a gameplay mechanic and it's not a problem, but I find replaying AC2, that's the biggest hurdle. Because you may get to unlock Florence after the first mission and you think, let's try and get all the viewpoints first, let's have a nose around Florence. And then you get to a point where you get desynchronized because it's restricted. So then you pushed into doing the next mission to get more of the map unlocked. And it's kind of a loop where I'm like, I get it, it's a good story mechanic and really fun. But I just want to go explore Florence before I do the story because I already know how the story plays out. I I think that makes sense. Um yeah, that's I I do agree that that's a little it slows you down a little bit. Um, but I think at least <laughs> I I just realized I never ran into that problem because usually if I start a new game, um, I w- I I usually want to do at least a little bit of the story first because if I just you know fire up AC two and just to you know take a walk through Venice or Florence or Monteriggioni. I usually already have a save file where I have completed everything and I just go and, you know, run run around, basically. <laughs> but that, um, yeah, I, I see how could that be. Anno- yeah. That could be annoying, definitely. I was also kind of curious, now that, you, you know, you've just finished replaying it, and I'm sorry if this is, you know, uh, off topic or, or something, but um, how would you... Um, how would you rate the gameplay after 10 years? Do you think that has aged well or not? Because there's, you know, different opinions about that. This is where I'm getting into trouble, isn't it? Depends on what you say. Um, <laughs> depends what you say, man. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> Snap. Ooh. I'm sweating, Sophie. Put me on the spot. <laughs> um, okay. Prepare to be... Okay, I'll admit it. All AC games before Unity have not aged well. On one, Ooh. on only one point. Okay. There's only one point I will stand by and I will die on my hill defending it. It's, <laughs> com- it's just combat. I really think the way the world looks, the way the story moves, I have a bit of issues with the puppeteer tier system, yes. I have a bit of an issue with the map being blocked off with the memory restrictions. But I do love them. As a separate piece because you know you're playing the memory you're synchronizing it gets bigger bigger i like that loop but combat to me has always just been dull arcadey and repetitive because as you can see with assassin's creed 2 and i'm really noticed it now um the enemies have i'm trying to remember the one i did last night has eight diamonds above his head if you use your normal x button for attack it can take up to 10 seconds to get all eight down, but it's very button mashy. The animations are not very slick. Or you can insta kill just by waiting for them to attack and then you parry, counter, parry, counter. And it just creates this loop that I kind of don't like about the old combat where, unless it's the Juseries or the bigger heavy arm guards where you've got to hit them, you can't always counter. And even then, when you're hitting them, it's like hitting a wall. It's just cling, bounce back, cling, bounce back. It's so difficult that I just kind of wish that combat was more how it evolved in Unity, where there's a bit more free flow to it. There's different animations, different style, instead of just being heavily relying on just counter, parry, counter, parry. Get 10 guards in a row, and you can just insta-kill by counter, parry, counter, parry. And it's practically slow as well. <laughs> the parry system is so slow and I know that's the only complaint I've had and probably going to get in trouble for it <laughs> I mean, I don't know uh, I don't know about James, maybe maybe he'll be the one to, to put you on the stake hmm well 
let me think. So I, 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 I'm going to answer, but I'm going to just set the history first so people know where I'm coming from. So, um, and I'm going to give my play order here so you understand why I'm saying what I'm saying. So I played Odyssey first, then Origins, which are fairly similar. I know Odyssey's got the uh, the abilities. Then I played Syndicate, and then I played AC2. None of those three games set you up for the melee combat style of the early games, AC1, AC2, and so on. Um, Now, (laughs) I know now, because it's nearly two years later from when I first played AC2, but I didn't know at the time, because when I play any any video game, I, I don't watch tutorials i don't read strategy guys because i don't really want spoilers and i find that you know youtube some youtube content creators are pretty good at avoiding spoilers and some just they'll have spoilers in the thumbnails you know and i I don't want any of that so i i avoid all sort of tutorials um i didn't know about the whole uh, counter kill thing um in these games and i'm not a very clever gamer right Um, So I played AC2. I really enjoyed the story. I enjoyed the sort of the evolution of the character and the opening up of the parkour as he learns new skills. It's a really beautiful game. It still looks good today. But I just assumed the combat was button mashy. And yes, you are just endlessly beating your sword off of the metal armor of these bad guys until you've chipped away their health. Because I didn't realize that if I'd have been a bit more patient and a bit more thoughtful or, you know, spent five minutes watching a, a Jace's guide or, or someone like that on YouTube, that, yeah, if you time it right, you can insta kill all of these people and then, you know, get on with the rest of the game. So I always found the melee combat really kind of boring because I was just sitting there spamming attack, not knowing that there was actually a whole nother way. So that's not a criticism of the game. That's a criticism of me probably not doing the right research or just trying stuff out um so i would say sophia that i'm probably not a great um what's the right word i'm probably not a great yardstick for measuring um (laughs) whether the combat is any good or not i tell you what i did watch a few months ago um so i mentioned him a moment ago a guy called jaces who does all kinds of i mean he he does videos about all kinds of games but he does a some really good in-depth videos about assassin's creed and he did he released one a few months ago to be fair it could be a year ago time flies and he was he was just just not not commentated at all, but just like a, a highlights reel of melee combat in AC two, and it was glorious. Um, he was counter killing. Can you do chain kills in AC two? Nope. I can't remember. It's a brotherhood thing. Um, no, okay. So again, Black Flag, which I've just finished playing today, chain kills are great when you get it all set up. It's awesome. Um, but he was taunting the guards, so they would attack him, and then he was instantly killing them, and it was amazing. Um, again, you put the time and the effort in, of course, you master the systems, you build up the muscle memory, you, you can do all these things. But I just, I didn't, I, I wasn't committed enough, I suppose, to to put the time in and, and really understand it. But watching a pro do it, it, it was fantastic. <laughs> Honestly, I, I'm just impressed that you managed to get through the game without counter killing once. Because... Do you, do, you, do you want me to tell you, I'm going to hold that thought. <laughs> um <laughs> I may have counter killed accidentally, but not put the connection between what my hands did on the keyboard and mouse to what was happening on the screen. Like I said, I'm not very clever. Um, I didn't really understand um, how to properly use smoke bombs until I got to Rogue, which was in the middle of last year. So um, how the hell I've completed <laughs> any of these games <laughs> over the last couple of years, I do not know. Mate, it's, it's almost You've accidentally been playing I mean, on hard mode yeah. the, this entire time. <laughs> I Yeah. Yeah, everyone says these games are easy, and I'm like, wasn't easy for me. This game's bloody impossible. But yeah, honestly, I don't think I ever used a smoke bomb, or I never used a throwing knife in AC2 because I couldn't figure <laughs> out how to use them because I'm an idiot. So if you're listening to this, yeah, I'm an idiot, absolutely, because I didn't realize it's kind of an auto lock on, and you just tap the button, and you th- I know it now. If I was to go back and play AC2 now, that'd be amazing. But yes, I was playing it on nightmare difficulty. I mean, you know, yeah, that's, that's kind of impressive. That is kind of impressive. <laughs> I, I yeah, I, I, I can imagine. <laughs> I, I, for one, relied almost entirely on the counter kill. Not much from the smoke bombs. I don't really use the, those much. Uh, but the counter kills and the throwing knives, especially in the areas where you're not supposed to get detected, those were my lifesavers the entire time. 
Mm. Um, mm. So yeah, going back to the original question, I actually, <laughs> I actually can't, you know, uh, I can't criticize Declan either because um, I, 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 I kind of agree. Like the thing about AC2 and combat, uh, and I remember like the first time I saw it, uh, I saw a playthrough on YouTube and I was super fascinated with it because, you know, it was uh, a lot smoother than the first game and um, Ezio looks cool, like, you know, when he's doing his things, he just looks good. And so I was like, man, I, I could watch this for hours and probably I, st I still could. But when you actually play it, even if you if you know all the moves, it's still, you know, a button mash. All you have to do is, you know, either attack or parry and then counter kill, or you taunt and counter kill, um, or you can also throw like dirt in your in your enemies' faces. Uh, that's you know a little more. Uh, it's got a little more uh, flavor, so to speak. But oh, how do you do that? Do you have to be in particular areas, or can you throw dirt? You can at any throw time? it at any time, but you have to do. Like, yeah, but you have oh. to learn that. If you go to Monteregioni, there's, you know, the training circle and you can actually learn new techniques there. Damn. Do you know what I'm realising, Declan? I'm literally the worst person who's ever played these games. <laughs> <laughs> Probably should use the training room occasionally. <laughs> it's all right. Oh. It's all right. I, I think it took me a, a few tries to figure that one out too because I saw somebody else do it and I was like, wait. How come I can't do that? So, yeah, uh, trial and error. Mm. But mm. I, I, I'm also gonna defend uh, the fact that it's so you know, it's very easy and it can get boring very fast because it's repetitive. Uh, but I think the main, at least how I've always excused it in my mind. I don't know if it's if it's what the developers had in mind. Uh, but for for the most part in AC two you're not supposed to fight you're still you know you still have you're, or you're, at least you're supposed to move around like an assassin especially in the first half mm. when you're in venice you know uh you're not supposed to be seen so i think the idea was you know let's not make the combat too complicated because ideally they're not going to be using it a lot yeah <clears throat> just to bounce off that point i'm gonna actually agree 100 percent because i hate button mashing so much in ac2 i spend a ton more money and time buying throw it knives because there is nothing so satisfying in assassin's creed 2 than going to a rooftop throwing a couple thrown knives walk the edge double assassinate some guards and then lose yourself in the crowds that is just the pinnacle of gameplay for the game. It's just so satisfying. And when you get it wrong, it's even more entertaining. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I think that was the idea. Because uh, I kind of found the same, uh, the same mechanic, so to speak, uh, in Origins, ironically enough. Because in both games, uh, like in AC2, some missions require you to be stealthy, otherwise you're gonna dis get desynchronized. Uh, but once you're, you know, free roaming, you can pretty much do whatever you like. And you can play as an assassin, you can play as a fighter, whichever you prefer. But for this specific reason, for the fact that being a warrior that fights uh, is not very entertaining, the, the game kind of pushes you to be stealthy. And I found the same thing more or less in in origins uh for yeah That's yeah for example when you when you enter forts and technically there's nothing in the game holding you back from going berserk and killing everybody you know at first but if you do that you you will either be extremely skilled and pull it off like a champ or you will die horribly so it's better for you if you do it stealthily you know I think you are the first person that's ever brought what's been on my mind since playing Origins to the forefront. I agree, you know, with Origins AI, it's so easy to map where they're going, and combat really out in the open is not as much fun as the stealth. 
it's not perfect, but you know, as you said with like forts, going in doesn't look entertaining. If you go in stealthily, it is a lot of fun. But not a lot of people talk about how Origins and Stealth can be really fun if you put the work in. And it looks amazing as well. Just side tangent yeah, in a way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think uh I, I think that was the idea, because uh, you know, technically technically speaking, that's the main idea of the game, you know, being stealthy and, you know, moving around like an assassin, working the shadows, all that. So I I, th- I think it's very cool, actually, that they let you, in some games more than in others, they let you choose, uh, you know, you can do whatever you like, but this is how you're supposed to do it. So if you do it this way, it's going to be fun and possibly easier. But if you still, you know, want to go the other way, you have a possibility to do that. I think that's really cool. Give people the options for the play style, but yeah, make melee combat punishing. Exactly. Yeah. Makes sense to me. Yeah. Because in theory, we should never be yeah, detected. In theory. Because <laughs> we're, we're good assassins. In theory, not when I play. <laughs> I can tell you that. I'll tell you, I know this is a stupid comment to make. And of course, it, it marks me out as an idiot, but I'm going to make it anyway. Um, again, coming from the newer games and Syndicate as an example, which is, in my opinion, a fantastic Assassin's Creed game. Um, <laughs> when, when you're walking across the roofs of, of Venice or, or Firenze, and I just couldn't understand why, why can't I crouch Ezio? He can be seen by everyone. He's standing taller than all of the chimneys. The guards can see him. Just damn crouch, man. Now, of course, I get it. It's just a silly mechanic. You can hide and you can use the rooftop gardens. But there were so many things that didn't quite connect with my brain. You know, crouching, of course, came in later. But it was just one of those things that always made me laugh. You know, there's there's not... I'm thinking about it now. And again, this is just because Black Flag is fresh in my mind. You know, Black Flag has stalking zones. And there's lots of environmental places you can hide, whereas there just isn't um, in Assassin's Creed 2. You can make blending zones with with hiring um, dancers or, or whatever. Um, but yeah, you don't have a lot of environmental options, do you, to stay hidden? You really are relying on those crowds. All the rooftops, Maybe Ed's his knees were hurting the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> He's been yeah. jumping off of too many roofs, yeah. <laughs> jumping out of too many windows. Um, so go on, Declan, what other bombshells do you want to drop on the show today? I'm I'm really scared to drop this one, but I've been biting my tongue. I've not posted it on Twitter. I really want to talk to it with Sophia and you. But, bombshell, I have only realised now, on my second replay, technically Ezio is not an assassin. In the same vein as Edward. Because when I first played the game, and you know, you don't follow, you follow the story, but you don't pay too much attention to the little things. I've only really recently realised from you getting your robes after your daddy's family are killed to being indoctrinated in the brotherhood is 10 years. You play Ezio as an assassin for 10 years of his life, but he was never truly indoctrinated into the brotherhood. So technically for a huge chunk of the game, Ezio isn't an assassin till the end. Which in my opinion, is very mind-blowing that you've got Altair, an assassin, demoted but grew to an assassin. Ezio took the assassin's creed, essentially, driven it for revenge to then be indoctrinated into the Brotherhood. And that is actually a fantastic outlook on the story after so long, in my opinion. Remind me, I, I remember the scene, and again, my memory's not great. I remember the scene where all the characters sort of gather around him and, and say, you know, we've, we've been here with you forever on this journey. At what point in the story, do, and this is a question maybe for Sophia, at what point in the story do they sort of formally admit him into the Brotherhood? All right, so um, Etsubi officially becomes an assassin in Venice um, towards the... Technically, towards the end of the game, uh, if you don't count the DLCs, like, without that. Um, and that happens more or less, uh, as as um, as we were saying, about 10 years after, you know, the beginning of the game. And what happens uh, is when you... Do you remember the, the whole Prophet thing? When 
you know, uh, I choose with the with the thieves, and there's a shipment that comes from Cyprus, I believe. I don't. I'm hoping <laughs> Declan will say yes. I, okay. I remember this. Of course, I remember this. So there's a shipment coming in. Do, do you really, Declan? I'm not sure about the tone in your voice. <laughs> oh no, I do. I know okay, it's, good, good. it's going. It's all right, it's all Sorry, right. Sophia. Um, but yeah, there's the shipment coming in, and uh, I think it's the the the, the thief guild that uh, is hyping this thing up, saying, "Oh yeah, there's this." Uh, the Templars believe there's a prophet in town. We don't know what it's for, what it's about. Uh, but there's this very important uh, thing or person that's coming into into Venice, and the Templars want it. So um, they uh, that's the apple actually. <laughs> but you know, um, they meet up with uh, with Rodrigo. They they try to you know uh, stop whatever the Templars are doing. And Etsy does this by himself. Like uh, he gets the information from Leonardo, but he thinks he's on his own. And then, as he's fighting uh, Rodrigo Borgia, the rest of the Brotherhood shows up because you know they're also looking for the artifact and the prophet. And that's you know the interesting part in which you obviously defeat R- Rodrigo, but he runs away. And that too is j- just turns around and around and he's like, "What? This prophet? Said, what? Did he not show up? What? What is? What is all this about?" And collectively, all the the other ones are just like, uh, "We don't know how to break this to you, but you're the guy." And so at that point, it's you know, Etsy kind of realizes like, "Oh, wait, you guys are part of the same group. We've all been doing this together, even even if I didn't know." And so he kind of realizes that he's been an assassin for over a decade without realizing and officially gets into the Brotherhood, basically. One cool detail to add, sorry, before you continue, James. Um, <clears throat> we all know ceremonial, you've got to have your ring finger cut off uh, to get the hidden blade. That's why Leonardo's the idiot and like, Drops a cleaver and you're like, oh, there goes his finger. Ezio actually gets a ring branded onto his left hand yep. ring finger, which would be the same finger you lose when you get your first hidden blade. So I just think mm. that's a real cool touch to show now you're part of the Brotherhood. Yeah, it's less drastic, but it's still, you know, signed uh, forever. <laughs> yeah. I actually only remember that from, from Brotherhood when they. Uh, when they bring um, Claudia into the group and they do the same ceremony, don't they? Put the brand um, on the ring finger. The only thing I was going to say, Declan, was it was really nice to hear the story summary. <laughs> that was all I was going to say. That was a nice nice summary of the story. Yeah, I'm not the best storyteller. I didn't have but, anything yeah. particularly clever. <laughs> that was yeah. great. It was great. But yeah. Uh, but I, as, uh, as we were saying, I, I also noticed that... The, second or third time around that I was playing the game, the, the fact that you're, you're not actually an assassin until basically the end of the game. But I think what was so clever about it was that you really, like, they really managed to show that being an assassin is not much about the, the ceremony or, you know, your ring finger being altered somehow. Or, you know, having a creed, you know, a proper doctrine Uh, on your back it's just about how you behave uh what your drives are because obviously Ezio was acting out of vengeance but as the story goes on he's also just trying to help people around him and he just behaves like an assassin and that's what being an assassin really is even if he doesn't have the title or you know the ring finger cut off or again altered so I don't know. I, I think it was uh, an interesting philosophical, quote unquote, aspect of the game. And it, it kind of, in my opinion, pioneers what we see in uh, with Black Flag, with Edward. You know, he does the assassin's work without being an assassin. And then theoretically, we look at um, Origins, Odyssey, Valhalla, you know, all of them fill. The doctorates, like technically, you could ignore half the mechanics in Odyssey, but Cassandra would never kill the innocents. Like, canonically, she never has innocence in novels. So, 
all these characters live out the free tenants without being in the Assassin Brotherhood. So when you look at how Ezio did the 10 years and then become an assassin, it's like philosophically, as you said, you don't need the title to be an assassin. And it kind of opens the door for Assassin's Creed to explore what it means to be an assassin more than just a title. I completely agree. I think the only the only difference that I found with uh, at least the last two games um, was that, at, you know, as I mentioned, Ezio at some point starts fighting uh, in more of a social way. Like he's not just looking out for himself at some point. I did not really pick that up with uh, Cassandra and uh, and Abel because yeah, I did. There no, was no social no. commentary, and most of the things they were doing, like yes, they would never hurt an innocent person. At least Cassandra. I'm not sure about Abel because you know the rating and all, um, but and they also they were also just looking out for themselves the entire time. So I think that's the difference, mainly. Mm. It's funny, it's a good point, even with the crossover story that was added to Odyssey and then to Valhalla in December. Cassandra, what we know of Cassandra is she is still basically on her own from the rest of humanity, doing her own thing. Um, yeah, you're right, there is, no so that, <laughs> there is no social aspect there. As for Valhalla, that's one of the, the key problems for Valhalla, which is how can you have a Viking raiding game where the Vikings or the Norse, you know, raided towns and monasteries and took who they wanted and killed who they wanted, but also have a game where one of the tenants is, you know, <laughs> stay your blade from the flesh of the innocent. And that that's the central problem, which always, it never, it never like broke my immersion or any of that rubbish because it's a game, but you know, you're doing a raid with Eivor and you kill a monk and then the game says, it pops up and says, killing another civilian will ro result in desynchronization. Well, I'm on a Viking raid, mate. I'm going to kill some people. It's just, you know, it's the way it goes. Um, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> that never really worked for me. I mean, I when I was playing Valhalla uh, Odyssey, I, I do try to role play as a, as a good Mystios. I don't set my set out to kill all the innocent civilians but sometimes they will attack you with a broom and in which case they've got to die <laughs> that was the know? funniest thing um, about that all... <laughs> oh it's great it's great or they pick up a spade or a shovel and they come charging at you with a shovel you're like yeah on, look at me. <laughs> i'm a god also like, <laughs> i'm a demigod well, how, why do you care that if i'm killing a guard just mind your own business <laughs> oh it's hilarious yeah yeah it's hilarious all right, Declan, so let's have a look. So we are, we are 48 minutes in, and you've dropped three bombshells on us. Should we talk about parkour? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, moving on. Thanks for, thanks for joining, everyone. We'll uh, see you next week. Come on, mate. You can't leave it there. Oh, no, because I swear I'm going to start getting emails and letters, people twining that all the same I'll tell you what, not parkour. I'll tell you what. <laughs> I, I'm going to give you my opinion, and this will be following on from what I said earlier when I was talking about my uh, limited skills with melee combat. And that's going to kind of set the scene for you, Declan, all right? Because we're going we're gonna to go into this gently. So I didn't really use the parkour very much at all in Assassin's Creed 2. Um May, and the main reason is the same as for me anyway. And this is this is just me being a noob. I get it. Feel free to leave uh, leave silly comments uh, on Twitter. Um, I the 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 roofs are covered with archers, and I just didn't understand why I'd run across the rooftops if I'm being shot at by archers. So mostly I stayed on the ground, um, and I would occasionally, you know, follow the the obvious parkour runs. Um, but he doesn't climb very fast, so why would I climb? And that, I, again, this is lack of knowledge. Of course, there are parkour starters, and that's what you've got to look out for. And I know that now, and I'd probably play it differently now. But um, yeah, I, I didn't really use the parkour very much. I, I didn't find it. Um, it's more challenging to understand and access, I felt, or at least to do it well. Um, but again, that's probably just time and, and really throwing yourself into it. I think for me, probably because I was... At that point, I was I decided I was going to play through the back catalogue. So I was kind of do the main story of this one, move on, do the main story of the next one, move on, rather than perhaps perhaps if I had been a younger person and played this when it was released, 
I might have spent a year playing it and really understanding the movement and the mechanics and the combat. Whereas I was kind of like, do the story. Okay. Enjoyed that. Move on. Um, so yeah, there's my summary. I didn't use the parkour very much for different, for a few different reasons. Declan. Again, as I've always said, I don't like parkour in Assassin's Creed. Like, it's great. You're going to get cancelled. It's great for a traversal. So fast. I know. But it's like, <laughs> when you take a close look at Assassin's Creed 2, you realise that a lot of the mechanics for Assassin's Creed 2 are built without parkour in mind. There's throw coins for distracting guards. Mm -hmm. You don't need parkour. There's hiring countesses. You don't need parkour. There is social stuff on benches. You don't need parkour. The rooftop has arches that you could throw one or two throw knives at, but the real guards are down below. The scenery on the rooftops is just the rooftops. You know, on the ground level, you get the shops, you interact with the shops, you interact with the people, you pickpocket, you can loot, you can push, take the codex pages that are on ground level to blend in. It's ground level. It's just, it's good, it's smooth, it's very posh and fancy to look at. No complaints. It's good. Do you need to use it? Well, no. You know, if you want to pickpocket, you can't do it on the roof. You know, if you want to get past a guard stealthily, you can either spend two minutes trying to find an access point on the wall because he's not Spider-Man, you've got to have a route up. Or you can throw some gold coins, get the guards distracted, and then walk through willy-nilly. So, I'm going to get cancelled, definitely. <laughs> yeah, Twitter is not going to take this kindly. <laughs> uh, but I actually kind of agree. Uh, Gameplay-wise, I don't think it's necessary either. A apart from, you know, a few missions here and there. I think... Um, I think the... The important part about parkour in... In, in all of AC, to be honest, but, you know, we're talking about AC too, so let's take that for example. But I I think it's, you know, mostly about the aesthetic part of the game and, you know, uh, agility. You know, you know, assassins are agile. They, they manage to get everywhere they want and they do it fast <clears throat> and they can get away very fast as well. Now, that doesn't really work in AC2 because if you if you go on a rooftop, they're bound to find you at some point. But um, it still adds to the idea of the assassin in the night that sneaks, you know, in the rooftops. And if you want to do it, you know, more realistically, even some missions, uh, you're going to want to be on a rooftop instead of, you know, just following two feet behind the guard that could easily hear you five times throughout the path. Um, I mean, you can do that again. The gameplay allows you to, but if you want more immersion, I I guess uh, that's that's what parkour is there for, in my opinion. That and again, just you know, being being able to admire a city, like being able to admire Florence from a rooftop, which you usually don't get to do in real life. That's cool for me, at least. I always found that to be very cool and. Something that other games don't usually do. You don't get parkour in a lot of games. At least not detail parkour. It's a good point. Yeah. Movement's a lot more linear, isn't it? Or fixed to certain routes and so on. Yeah. And the, the slow parts, as you said, it takes a little bit of practice, but uh, usually the slow movements that Ezio has, you can, you can usually work around those. There's usually little tricks that you can pull to make it look faster in general. Mm. Mm. I, I mean, uh, this was um, something I saw. Uh, who shared it recently? I think it was Sebastian Memento Gallery on Twitter. He did a very short video showing basically just climbing up the wall or just doing a series of um, back ejects to, to make the same climb. And of course, it's much faster if you just do back ejects from two, two walls that are close together. I didn't know that, 
but of course now I do and I'd probably play the game very I, I, do you know what I'm thinking I'm gonna have to go and yes play it, absolutely <laughs> put put all of my knowledge and experience actually into use and play this game properly actually use a throwing knife <laughs> actually do some parkour might even do a wow. counter kill if I'm feeling brave <laughs> I know right <laughs> man you should definitely do that and that's actually the video that I was thinking of too because yeah. I I knew that was the thing, but you right, know, okay. I'm not fast enough to pull that kind of stuff off. But it looks cool, and it, it is pretty useful, especially in races. I yeah. Oh, it does. Because that's cool. the other thing. You've got races in AC2, which are secondary, but you you do need the rooftops for those most of the time. Mm. So Declan, that's four bombshells. Are there any more? I feel like you're just like digging a hole for me, <laughs> climbing. Seriously. So like, let, tell you, let, let me ask a different question. Are you enjoying Assassin's Creed 2? Of course I'm enjoying it, but now I really want to right. reel my fifth bombshell. Oh, God. <laughs> There's another one. Oh, oh you don't God. like Leonardo really... or something. Right. <gasps> I, I would, to be honest, off tangent, Leonardo being in the game made my day. I am obsessed with the Renaissance Italy. I love it. I love the literature, it's fantastic. So seeing Leonardo was just perfect. No, my just bombshell is, how much RPG mechanics are actually in Assassin's Creed 2? Not a bad thing. Uh -huh. I think it's great. I, I, It's not a complaint. I don't mind it. I think the gear system is great. Some of the chests are fine. I really do love the side quests, which is very weird because I don't usually like side quests. But all the RPG stuff in Assassin's Creed 2 is fantastic. I have no complaints. So, it big win. Hang on, hang still on. I'm curious. <laughs> what do you mean exactly by RPG elements? Oh, see, I googled this uh, ages ago. And that's really sad. So, RPG elements in a game to be classed as an RPG game comes down to basic me mechanics of gear management inventory management and resource management and base building there's like some of like the very light rpg mechanics now technically the villa will be classed as base building because you have to pour resources into changing the shops changes the stats you've got a gear system with the um, armor so you get two stars three stars and that each changes same with the weapon system there's uh, different strengths and micro stats but there's no actual stats in the game which is great there's lootable chests there's lot uh, loot picking um which is fine that's standard for most games but you need to use the resources to buy health you need to use a lot of the resources to build up the villa to buy armor to buy upgrades so it's like the standard very light rpg stuff you see in games like compared to the rpg stuff we see in later games it's very light light rpg but they're still in there if that yeah, makes sense yeah it makes sense i it, it's interesting though yeah i've never i've never considered those uh rpg elements uh, i just you know always thought of them as just open world activities but i guess the two could overlap so i never really thought of that that's a positive bomb that you just dropped i think um <laughs> Yeah, I think also there's, I'm not sure if there's a clear definition on what you need in a game to actually say this is a role-playing game. I mean, you're kind of role-playing as a young Italian assassin, so is that is that enough to make it a role-playing game? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not a game designer. <laughs> if you are a game designer, do feel free to write to us <laughs> and tell us. <laughs> so um, I, did, I did actually, when I got curious, I got my facts right. Um, I pulled up the link that I found years ago and um, defining RPGs is a very challenging for hybrid genres, but there's a five basic elements for an RPG game, and it's stuff like improve your character over the course of the game by increasing the statistics or levels. Technically, you could argue that with the gear system, because you get two stars, you get three stars to so level in. Um, Menu-based combat? No, because frankly it doesn't have that. But an inventory system with wearable equipment, such as armor and weapons? Yes. Um, essential quests that run through the game as a storyline and additional side quests. Maybe you could class some of the side stuff like the races as side content. 
that's a stretch definitely so if you if you i've not done all the, i didn't do any of the races and and there's a few other things i mean there's collectibles like the feathers which we should probably talk about in a minute um i know with the feathers you 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 do unlock or you complete the maria story but is there any little stories or cutscenes, or do you earn anything for completing the races and the other um side content <laughs> well um <laughs> that's not that's not the answer i expected which was just laughing in the way. <laughs> no because i'm thinking of a specific one and i, I am pretty certain that there's a, there's a demographic that will listen to this and know exactly what i'm talking about just even now um technically you don't get anything from the races apart from i think money um but there are a couple of cutscenes, and yeah, I can't okay. think. The only one that I can think of is this one that you're getting for Lee, and it's it's a very specific race. You don't get it until you are before the end of the game. Uh, but you've gotta you've gotta have the the DLC missions unlocked, I think. And technically, you don't get anything out of it, but that's it does because it's. Literally, the 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 entire plot of the mission is a lady challenges you to be two of her friends in a horse race. What you win, and I quote the game, this is not me, this is the game, what you win is a private ride. Oh, and nice. that's it. Okay. And that's the only cutscene that I can think of. Okay. <laughs> but technically, yeah, Understood. there is one. Understood. Okay. <laughs> Good old Ezio. <laughs> never, never misses. Never. <laughs> God. Uh, yes. Uh, Declan, save us. No, the feathers. <laughs> we were about to talk about the feathers, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> feathers, feathers. Thank you. Thanks. So, so young, young uh, Petruccio has made a. Um, is it a pear wood box to keep feathers in yeah. for his mother? That was, what a yeah, sweetheart. Sweet and depressing. <laughs> well indeed yeah um declan have you collected all the i know serverland hello serverland if you're listening she uh <laughs> she, <laughs> she's been keeping us updated on the sisterhood discord with her progress over the last few weeks of completing ac2 and she put a message in in the chat maybe a week ago and said okay look i've got 95 out of the fe of the feathers or something like that i am done i can't be bothered anymore i'm moving on and a few of us kind of said, come on, you're so close. You're so and so she went back and got it. She she helped Maria, which is great. Declan, Feathers, where are you? I'm gonna quote Sophia when she said, and depressing. Collecting the feathers is kind of depressing. <laughs> as an activity? <laughs> I just not as Yes, <laughs> as an activity. <laughs> it, one what is the need? Like, I understand the story planet from his brother, but why did his brother want feathers from all over Italy, is how I'm going to describe it, in the most backwater locations possible? <laughs> Climb to the tallest tower, and look, there's a feather. Why? The, these are where the birds left the feathers, my friend. I doubt... His brother has gone round with binoculars going, Oh, Ezio, there's one on that tower. Go get it for me. Oh, Ezio, there's one in the river. Go get it for me. It's just, it's like the flags all over again in AC1. They just made me go yeah. grey. <laughs> and I won't go near I them. I think there's actually a, a law reason for, for AC2, though. Um, again, it's, you know, it is what it is. But the technically the reason, the law so to speak, behind the feathers is that Petruccio was sick when he was, uh, he wanted to give something to his mother. He wanted to like give her a gift. Uh, I can't remember if it was for her birthday or for a special event or something, uh, but he wanted, he wanted this gift and he was sick. So there wasn't much he could do uh, apart from, you know, picking something pretty and giving it uh, to Maria. Which is why, you know, he asks for Ezio's help, because obviously he can't just climb up on a rooftop. Yeah. Right. And he, yeah. he was supposed to be a secret, but it isn't, because Mar Maria actually knows that, you know, he's plotting this feather gift. Which is why, 
once you know everything goes down with the with the rest of the family she enters you know that non-verbal phase in which she's just kneeling at her bed and yeah. you know technically counting the feathers that Etsy brings her it's because she knew that that was going to be Petru- Petruccio's gift that she didn't get to give her and that so anytime Etsy sees a feather he's just like ah this reminds me of my little brother and so he just picks it up and gameplay wise that what that translates to in- is going all around Italy cursing everything because you can't find that last feather but you know <laughs> Or, to give it a positive spin, it's a chance for you to practice your exactly. parkour, Declan. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bo, I, I will tell you now, I think I collected about 35 feathers. I didn't look at any online maps to sort of find the locations. I just found about 30, 35 as I was playing the game. Have you got caught all the yeah, feathers, Sophia? Yeah, but uh, I agree that it's... Yeah. <laughs> nice. I, I agree that it's a drag, so I... I, I did it once. <laughs> Again, played the game anywhere between 15 and 20 times. I only completed the feathers once. That was enough. Yeah. That seems <laughs> fair. What about you, Declan? I collected the ones that your brother tells you to collect at the very start of the tutorial. Don't go hunting for them again. Fair enough. I mean, spoiler alert, if you play Brotherhood, um, even if you haven't collected all of the feathers... Mother is fine when she arrives in uh, in Monteriggione. She's recovered from her state, so you know it'll be okay. You don't need to collect all the feathers. The closest I can say in terms of, oh my god, this task will never end, is the number of chests in Syndicate. I think it's three hundred and forty-five chests, and if you want to hundred percent Syndicate, you have to open every single one. I've done it. I've done it once. I will never do it again. <laughs> Perfectly valid. Yeah. So that did take forever. Yes. Yes. <laughs> could say Good. i've done it and that's the main thing are there any other collectibles in assassin's creed 2 or is it just it's... feathers oh there's paint is there paint it's... you have to you have to rebuild monteriggio oh we've we've completely ignored monteriggioni and rebuilding the town and artwork <laughs> and the little and statues else. and the altair's armor and everything yeah <laughs> oh my right Alt. thank you altair's armor so um that was the thing i wanted to mention when declan was was dropping his bombshell about not liking parkour I think that's what you said, wasn't it, Declan? Um, <laughs> the the set pieces of the puzzles and exploring the different churches and, and tombs and whatever. I love that. It's amazing. I want more of that. I, it was one of the really nice additions to Valhalla and very simple, probably nowhere near as complex, but I really enjoyed doing the um, the tombs in Valhalla. Um, yeah, really enjoyed those set pieces to, to explore each um location and retrieve the keys yeah i think that was one of the best parts of the game and possibly part of why uh the game became so popular again just part of why um but what the tombs did apart from giving you a cool sigil and eventually an armor but i think the special thing about it was that it added to you know a layer of mystery because that's another thing that I, I keep forgetting. What what AC2 had that kept you going throughout the game is that obviously you knew you knew about the tempers. If you had played the first game, you knew you knew the deal. But it was different, you know. The tempers in one were out in the open, and you know they, they were not they were you know just fighting the crusade. There was no mystery around it. Um, but in two, it's you know kind of a cult. They, they hide underground. Uh, there's stuff about them hidden in catacombs. And then you have the tombs to explore, you know, these places which are hidden away from the rest of the world. And you get to be, you get to be an explorer and, you know, just go below, I don't know, uh, Firenze's Duomo and see something that nobody else in this world has. And I think, I don't know, I think that added uh, a special charm to the game. Hmm. How how accurate? I don't know if you've visited these places in real life. I've I don't think. Do you know I've never been to Italy? That's bad. Anyway, how how accurately do they do they recreate the cities in the game? Does it feel 
I know it's a video game, but does it feel real? Did they capture the kind of the spirit of the towns and in in the big set pieces like the big cathedrals? Did the, did they do a good job of bringing them Absolutely, to life in yes. the game? Uh, especially, I mean, nice. Florence. Uh, the, I mean, the the streets obviously are not uh, perfectly built as Unity did it, you know, um, but they're still mm. pretty accurate, like. I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna bring two examples. The first one, I'm, I'm actually gonna start from Venice uh, for the simple fact that I live here and that I I wasn't born here. Okay. So what I did is I played AC2 again around ten years ago, and I replayed it again and again. And eventually, at some point, I moved uh, to the city. And let me tell you, when I moved here, um, <laughs> the the GPS did not work. We did not have Google Maps. <laughs> <laughs> Don't panic, everyone. I've got a <laughs> yes. backup. Because uh, Venice is still very much in the in the 15th century. So I got here and I was like, well, how do how am I supposed to you know move around? And surprisingly, for the most part, you could just use the memory that you had from AC2. Again, not you know, down to the very specific street. But you could easily find your way around to the main, you know, landmarks just by remembering how you did it in the game. And I think it's more or less the same in Florence. I, I, I'm not a hundred percent certain, but I think they they did a pretty good job. Apart from a few things here and there, it was pretty good. And also mm. energy wise, mm. uh, you know. The the first time AC2 came out, uh, it had the color filters. I think they took it off uh, in the in the remastered, but the the original game had uh, a color filter both for Florence, um, Venice, and uh, and the other cities in the game. And that seems kind of silly because you know if you visit a city, it's not gonna be like blue or pink or whatever. But somehow they managed to do it right, because for uh, for Florence you had the you know uh, yellow slash orange tint, and that is exactly how it feels when you're in Florence because of how if you, if it's a sunny day, that's how the sun hits the walls, and most of the walls are either you know uh, red, brown, yellow, uh, okra. So that's that's the idea that you get of something that's very warm and very yellow and very, you know, bright and vibrant. And the same goes for Venice. The, most of Venice looks blue, mostly because of the water and the fog that you usually have around here. So, yeah, I, I would say they definitely did an amazing job at rendering them. It's interesting you say, I mean, first of all, you should be working for the Italian Tourist Board. Um, hopefully <laughs> but it's interesting what you say there <laughs> what you say about the color filters because you get that in in assassin's creed yes. one don't you the three cities each have their own color scheme for want of a better word now what you said there was in the remaster so in the Ezio collection for example that declan has they took out that kind of um that color scheme playing on pc where we don't have a remastered version available what you're describing there is what i remember because we, we haven't had that graphical change. Um, so yeah, each city does have its own. And and Forley's kind of a, a brownish, greenish, swampish yep. kind of place, isn't it? It's not it's not a pleasant city. To, I don't know what like it's like that. in real life again. I've never visited, but um, just like that. But, okay, sorry to anyone if you listen in Forley, but yeah, it's a bit swampy. <laughs> I'm actually from around that area, so I, I, can, I can vouch. It's just, yes. Understood. <laughs> understood you you could you can insult the things you are part of exactly. that's the rule of comedy so yeah <laughs> but yeah yeah no it's uh i actually don't know why they decided to take it out maybe maybe it was to have it in a more realistic filter i don't know um and i can't you know i can't speak for ac1 because i've never visited any of these cities that you get to visit in ac1 um but i always felt like they were you know pretty well done because, you know, sometimes uh, in films you get the Mexico filter, so to speak. That's what they usually call it. Yeah. And it... Yes. The very, very stereotypical yellow. Exactly. Awesome. And that's, you know, that's just poorly <laughs> yeah. done. But I think in, in AC they pulled it off pretty well, for me at least. Cool. 
Go on, Declan. I was just going to say, I think the reason they removed the colour pop filter for the remaster is pretty much hardware power. Like, I've done, I did a lot of research before going to PS4 just because I didn't know which one to buy. <clears throat> and in terms of graphical power and all that, apparently a lot of games on 360 had to use practically cheap tricks to get graphical power and make things look vivid and detailed. But on remasters like for the Xbox One and PS4, they don't need that sort of cheap mechanics anymore. They can just the game already enhances it, so I think they remove the pop filter, the color filter, because the games kind of resonate that without an extra filter. Because playing it on Xbox Series S with the um, FPS boost and everything, you still get that nice little color scheme that I remember from the original. So I think it's just, just a, I don't know how to word it. I'm trying to be technical when I'm not technical. I know yeah. what you mean. Um, it's still, it's still a shame because each city loses something that makes it feel a bit unique and a bit special. Um, I completely agree, but I, apparently not everybody yeah, likes it, it. I, I know, yeah, I know a guy oh, really? who actually lost his mind trying to mod the filters out of the original games when you know when we didn't have the remaster, and he was incredibly happy that they took it out, which surprised me quite a lot. Yeah, mm, interesting. <laughs> I suppose that 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 alone proves that as a game developer, you cannot please. Oh, definitely, everybody. definitely. <laughs> I don't envy the developers to be so honest. Actually, <laughs> no. Oh, I mean, I'm I'm guessing, despite if we ignore the technical and the artistic skills, the one thing you need more than anything else is a thick skin oh, yes. to be a game developer. Um, so, Sophia, have you played the the remaster, or have you just played the original <laughs> versions? Uh, I I played both. Uh, and believe it or not, it was not my choice. Or rather, it was. But there's this funny thing that happens. Uh, anytime, anytime I decide that maybe I am done playing the Ezio trilogy. Yeah. Oh, I know where you're going with this. And I laughed <laughs> my head. Go on. <laughs> this, this anytime I decide that maybe maybe it's time for Ezio and I to part ways, the universe finds a way. Yes, yes, there's no escaping. (laughs) Because when I, uh, at first I was playing on PS3, and shortly before um, the Etsy collection came out, my PS3 actually stopped working. Uh, It wasn't that for good, it just decided to give me a scaff a little bit. And so I thought, oh man, I I can't play AC2 anymore, like this is the end of an era. What am I going to do now? Q Ubisoft announcing the Etsy collection coming on, you know, all consoles. And obviously, what am I going to do? Not get it for my PS4? <laughs> of course not. So I played the remaster. <laughs> um, and I have been, I've been keeping up with my routine of replaying AC2 on my PS4 ever since. Uh, until, what was it, like last month? That I decided that once again, it was time to let it go. I had, ne- I had never, never uninstalled an Assassin's Creed game from anywhere. Because I only played on PlayStation and mobile when, um, like, I don't know if you guys ever played... uh, Right, that's another thing. I don't know if you guys have ever played Assassin's Creed Discovery. No, I've only seen... um, There is a game designer called um, Stanislav Kostuch who has a YouTube channel where he does uh, detailed... Do you know him? He does fantastic, really detailed reviews of... All kinds of games, but very slowly he is going through all of the Assassin's Creed games and doing one of his game design reviews. So I've only seen it from his design review, which I think he posted to YouTube maybe yeah, in December. So. Um, but if you've played it, I'm fa- I'm be interested to get your kind of experience. <laughs> well, um, that that was interesting. Honestly, I don't have a super clear memory of it because that one I only played a couple of times, and it was way back. Uh, but it was basically this small. Mm. I remember playing it on my iPod, iPod Touch, the one that came out in like two thousand eight or something. And yeah, yeah. Um, it was very, you know, very simple mobile game. I there wasn't a lot of plot. It was, um, if I remember correctly, Etsy goes to Spain, and uh, it's around the time that you know 
uh, Columbus decides to sail and look for um, what they will later fi- find out is America. Um, and I don't remember, again, I don't remember a lot about it, but I do remember that it was, it felt really weird for some reason. It felt really weird and um, it, I wouldn't, I don't have a memory of it as a good game. I didn't really enjoy it that much, but I still did not install it because, you know, that was just not an option. Together with uh, the other game, um, Altair's Chronicles, I think. That was more or less in mm. the same vein. Um, it, it was sli- slightly more enjoyable, uh, as far as I remember. Uh, but yeah, just a you know small mobile game. But still, never uninstalled that because that would be you know blasphemy in my book. Of course. Mm. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I finally decided to do it from my PlayStation, I was like, okay, I need space for Red Dead Redemption Two. That game is massive. I, something needs to go. And that something was the Ed's trilogy. And it, Oof. did it hurt when you finally yes, made yes, that decision? Yes, I just kept going all, all. I kept going over all of my games, and I was like, no, there must be something. Uh, Stardew Valley, <laughs> no, Stardew Valley is like nothing. This is gonna, this is not gonna help me. Um, Uncharted, no, I need to play Uncharted next on Twitch. Wait, uh, and it was the only one left, and I, I, I seriously felt like I was presenting divorce papers or something i was like god after 10 not what 12 years that we've done this it's finally come to this and so i'm there i'm mourning i finally delete this bloody application i'm like okay this is it i've done it you can't pull me back now not 24 hours later Ubisoft announces the Ezio trilogy for Nintendo Switch. They knew it. They were they've been waiting for you to uninstall this game for years. <laughs> they had it, yeah, in the back, and they were like, "Come on, <laughs> Sophia, you can do it." <laughs> some some community developer was watching your Twitter feed and they went, oh, "Guys, now is the time. Let's do it." <laughs> well, I gave them the right cue at the right time. <laughs> So this is a very important point. So uh, if you're listening to this, we are recording this on uh, Thursday, the 17th of February. The episode will go out in a couple of days time. Today is the day when the Ezio collection becomes available or uh, became available um, on Switch. So Sophia, have you you purchased this new uh, new version of the game? I unfortunately have not yet because I don't even own a Switch. But I have to say, I would feel like such a tool if i let go the possi- you know the chance to walk to saint mark saint mark square or the rialto bridge yep oh, you've got to do it and <laughs> not play the game in front of it <laughs> yeah yeah Having said that, that is a lot of money for the console and the game just for, just just to go and walk through the city and say, "Yep, I'm currently walking yeah. here and walking I'll, uh, here." I'll but see yes. if my pride takes over my wallet, so you know. <laughs> mm. Mm. we do have a switch in our household although it's mostly used for um, Fortnite and animal crossing and mario kart but uh, i've got it i've got all three games on my pc and um I, I would like to replay all three of them again hap- i'd happily replay them all again um but i i wouldn't purchase it for the switch just because That's i've already got enough. the games you know um so, so Declan, what, what, where I was going to go with this, and thank you, it's a great story, Sophia, and it did make me laugh when, when I saw your <laughs> <laughs> your two messages 24 hours apart. How does the, re- for both of you, how does the, maybe Declan, you go first, how does the remaster compare to, I mean, to be fair, Declan, it's been a long time, but how does it compare to the original game? Is it just that they've tweaked the filters or are there gameplay differences? Is there different content? <clears throat> to be fair, the only thing I knew that was different from playing it is DLCs because, gee and behold, I grew up in a gear for 10 years without Wi Fi. So, all the way to Assassin's Creed Black Flag and beyond, I didn't know there was DLCs for them games. So, the only new thing I've discovered is DLC. Apparently, there is DLC, and apparently, there's an auditory crypt which has references to one of my favourite literature works of art. So I haven't noticed anything different, just 
DLC. It's weird that there's DLC in there that I didn't know existed. It's a bit of an, again, I'm not an expert here, and it's a bit of a mess, is my understanding, between PC, PlayStation, Xbox, and maybe the Switch now is is yet another different, slightly different version, because my understanding is so that the DLC, and Sophia, maybe you correct me if I'm wrong here, the Battle of Forley is one of the DLC items, but it was only available on certain platforms at release, and then it was added to others later. Then the other DLC is the Bonfire of the Vanities. Again, I'm not sure if that was available on release or just on certain consoles. Certainly, I mean, again, I didn't even know there was DLC. When I played AC2, my game just led me to Forley and I did the Battle of Forley and moved on. I didn't realize it was DLC. I think it appears as Memory Sequence 12 or 13 or something, but I I just did it because it was there and I did the Bonfire of the Vanities. I don't remember what sequence that was, but I do remember that damn sequence killing those. uh, What's the name of the guy? And his lieutenants that you have to kill. Aim for Lee. Um, no, uh, the oh. Bonfire of the Vanities. <laughs> um, um, uh, Girolamo Savonarola. Thank you, Savonarola. That damn mission killing some of the. There's one particular person you have to kill, and again, my memory's hazy. He's in a a square. He might be a preacher, and he's speaking to a crowd, and he's surrounded by guards, and you have to sneak through the crowds. I couldn't do it. I got detected and killed every time. And in the end, I went onto YouTube and I watched someone stand in the crowd nearby, pull a, pull out the gun, which I'd never used at that point. <laughs> Are you surprised? And uh, shoot him. And I thought, I'm just going to do that. So I walked into the nearest crowd, pulled out my gun, shot him, mission done, move on. But yes, that one that one left me um, tortured, <laughs> trying to kill off those, those lieutenants of uh, Savonarola. Um but yeah, I didn't realize there was DLCs because on PC they're just they're just there in the memory sequence. You just play them. Um, what about you, Sophia? Did you notice any any sort of major differences with the the remaster compared to the uh, original? I mean, apart from the graphics and again, you know the 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 colors being a little different, uh, the faces being a little changed. I did not notice a lot of difference, especially especially I have to say in AC two and and even Brotherhood, I think, I did not see a lot of differences. I did see, however, um, it did feel very different in Revelations for some reason. Um, I- I'm not sure what exactly was changed, but um, the lightning, I think the lightning was uh, very, very different. It-, it felt very different, at least. But in AC2, um, I wouldn't say, yeah. I, I'd already played the DLCs as well, and as you said, yeah, it was it was uh, quite a mess in the beginning. I, I think only the consoles, I think only PlayStation got it in the beginning, or maybe it was just the consoles, I don't remember, but I remember the PC guys had uh, some issues because it wasn't, it wasn't coming out, um, and it was also, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was released about six months, nine months later on PC, More wasn't less, it, I yeah. think, originally. And it was very Something confusing like as well, because uh, when the DLCs came out, most people who had gone the game obviously had already finished it. So what we did was just go back in time, basically, after you, you do the whole Vatican thing, and just go back to when Ezio is in his, like, 30s, more or less. And doing all the random missions, like I had, I had trouble placing it in the beginning. I did not realize that happened between uh, the initiation in Venice and uh, the Vatican adventure in the beginning, because it was, you know, yeah. Ah, uh, so it must have. I so yeah, for me it flowed very well because yeah, you're on the road back from Venice, you go into Forley, there's a battle. And then you move on. But yes, that makes a <laughs> now you mention it, Sophia. That must have been I guess you play it because it's there and you play it, but it must have really messed with people's heads. Hang on a minute, what's going on here? Why are these yeah, people basically. still alive? You know. Um Yeah, interesting. Go on, Declan. Just a small tangent on top of the DLCs, because this actually came up in the Mentors Guild the other week. <clears throat> because PC doesn't have the Ezio collection. You only have like Assassin's Creed Two of Revelations. Yeah. Apparently, Ubisoft has shut down all DLC servers for Assassin's Creed Two. So a lot of the DLC, like the Elder Tory Vault, is impossible to get on PC. So what is that vault? <clears throat> because are we talking about oh. the area underneath <clears throat> Monteregioni Villa? 
there's another area on the mountain in the villa next to it where you meet Domenico Auditore, if I pronounced mm. his name right, and he's he was mentored by, and I love this, and I'm drooling, Dante Aguilar, I can never pronounce his name, but the guy who wrote the and Divine Maestro Comedy. Maestro Alighieri, yes. Gotcha. That was pretty cool. <laughs> I, I love, I love his works. I have read the Divine Comedy five times. Inferno is the best poem I've ever read. And seeing him being part of the Assassin Brotherhood on Facebook, because I didn't know the Alditori Vault existed, but he trained Domenico Alditori is just wonderful. And now I had kind of that half the characters in Inferno yeah, are just Templars. Yeah. I that was very cool for me as well because in Italy if you there's different kinds of high schools um there's you know the the education system is a bit jumbled up but basically when you're 13 or 14 uh you get the chance of you know choosing which path of study you want to take so you can either go for more practical schools or more the theoretical schools um if you go to a theoretical s- school uh that's a lyceum we call it um you do classical studies and if you, I, I did one of those, and I can tell you that anything by Dante is just the Bible in Italy for literature. So uh, we had to study a lot of the comedy, a lot of his other poems, and uh, even the prose. And I, I think we spent three years just studying his works. So when I saw him in AC, I, I hadn't gotten the, the Auditorio Crypt in the original game. I only got it with the, rema- the, with the remastered version. I was elated. I was like, yeah, I, I've been waiting five years for this. It sounds to me, Declan, like you need to go back to school, but do it in Italy so you can spend three years studying Dante's work. To be honest, off tangent, and I know I should be going off tangents, but in school, we were supposed to be reading Of Mice and Men, and... Uh, none of the kids wanted to read it. This is year seven, perhaps. Mm. Oof. I, that in year I wa- seven. Jeez. I walked in and I said to the teacher, true story, Miss, I've already read this book. Can I read <laughs> something else? And she's like, how have you read it? I was like, I was in the library last lunchtime and I picked it up. Brilliant. And like, right, well, year 12s are studying Dante's Inferno. Bet you've never read that. I was like, yeah, I've just took it out from the library. <laughs> Nice so one. yeah, yeah, year seven, I was already like reading his works, and yeah, right, I was fluent in Romeo. You would have been a Romeo and Juliet for Italian school. <laughs> Man, I think literature. you need to move the family to Italy, my friend. <laughs> I love to us. I love literature, and I know Talib but books has been one of my forefronts, and and still off tangent, it's so hilarious seeing all like the smart children in school struggle to read a single stanza from any of Dante's works and you're just there reading it perfectly like it's English. <laughs> I, I mean, have to go to Italy. Yeah. I belong there, <laughs> literature-wise. Uh, but yeah, to uh, to circle back, I, I think it's super cool that they... Because that's another thing that I always loved about Assassin's Creed, especially, I don't know, we also had that in, in the latest ones, but for some reason it felt different. But the way they managed to, you know, entangle the assassins with historical figures and writers and artists and everybody, it just felt so real. So unbelievably real. And I, I, I think it was incredibly cool. I'm sad that this is not available on PC. So what did you say it's called? It's not, it's not the sanctuary because that's where all the statues are of the yep. assassins where you unlock um, Altair's uh, armor. The, the name, name of, of, the, of the actual crypt it was just Auditore Crypt. And I... Yep. Just the Auditore uh, I th- Crypt. Okay. I think there's something about it on the wiki, but... Yep. Well, guess what I've been doing? Whilst you two have been talking, I've been <laughs> furiously Googling to try and find the Auditory Crypt. And I can't really? find it on the wiki either. So I'm going to keep looking. Uh, Declan, say something intelligent. <laughs> keep, keep, keep everyone talking while I Google. Uh, <laughs> fun fact, I found it on the wiki 10 minutes ago. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, what? Auditory Family Crypt. Oh, so my bad. There is an so art. Yeah, what an idiot. See? I'm being stupid again. But it's... It's just perfect. I think 
I will admit, my biggest complaint for Assassin's Creed 2 was always, why was there no mention of Dante? Because reading his works and seeing how he put a lot of people in hell, including like poets and Julius Caesar and all that, you kind of expected, you know, this guy's basically annoying everybody, writing a, a, probably something that goes against the Catholic Church at the time, why he wasn't an assassin? And you know, it's kind of surprising that I wish I had Wi-Fi back in the day to get that DLC, but can't wait to yeah. explore it properly now. I mean, they still might, because Dante is about, I think, a hundred years mm. before Etsy came along, so, you know. Yeah, and he's absolutely. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, it, it was surprising when I when I first played Brotherhood. I, I I also had that thought. I was like, why did why did they not put Dante in? Because they already love <clears throat> like the AC team seems to love you know literature or literary uh, references. Is we I we all caught uh, Machiavelli's reference in Brotherhood, right? Oh, he's going to go, he talks about right. <laughs> yeah, he's, what's the line? He says something like, I'm going to go and write a book about the prince. And doesn't Ezio say something like, make him a little bit younger? I can't, it's something like that. It's my, again, my memory is hazy. Tell, yeah, tell me the, the right line, uh, Sophia. Basically, Machiavelli, after uh, Ezio becomes master assassin, he just, you know, looks at him and goes, I'm mm. going to write a, a book about you one day. And Ezio just turns around and goes, well, yeah. if you do, make it short. And short. the brilliant yes. thing about that is that <laughs> The Prince by Machiavelli is actually about Cesare. So, you know, just a big smack in the face. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Guess I need to go and read that book next. Then when I finish my car, I've got so many. I've, I'm trying this year. I've told myself to read through some of the books that I've got on my backlog on my Kindle. And I've read three so far. Uh, two so far this year and i'm i'm gonna get through the rest of the backlog but it sounds like i need to add the prints to my uh, my collection it. i mean it's a bit heavy ish but you know worth it mm -hmm. okay I'll, I'll skim read it it'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> at the moment i'm trying to copy you and get all the assassin's creed books on a kindle which is proven a nightmare because there are so many of them but there are there are and I'm still reading Sherlock Holmes. 66 of these buggers to read, and I've only read seven. <laughs> You've got some insane yeah. reading ahead of you, my friend. I've got, um, I just started the Black Flag novel today. To be Perfect fair, I novel. started it months ago and I never finished it. So I'm reading it again from scratch. Then I've got the novelization of the film to read. And then I think I've read all of, well, I've read all of the main game series books. I know there are young adult books and I know there are comics. I'm not sure if I will read any of those. But, um, 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 just a thing, you need to read Last Descendants. Okay, I've heard that from someone else. To tell, we're, we're still talk, we're, we're not talking about Assassin's Creed 2 anymore. Who cares? <laughs> tell me about Last Descendants. Have, have you read I Last have Descendants, not, Sophia? Actually, because, oh. yeah, I just... I read, I think, The Last Crusade, which I liked very much, and then I went on to read the the AC2 and Brotherhood novels, basically, uh, Renaissance and Brotherhood, mm. was it called? I don't remember. Um, and I really did not like them, so I just gave up on them. <laughs> yeah. So, the reason why I'm saying you should read Last Descendants is it takes what we know about the Animus and spins on his head in such a good way like right. no spoilers but the in the first one and i might get it wrong because i've just read it uh last year there's four characters four main characters and the animus is actually able to put all four in the same memory because all four interacted at some point in that memory so you can see the same memory from four different views because they all interacted now, bear in mind, in the games, we only ever see one view, but imagine being able to see Assassin's Creed ah, 2 okay. from yeah, Mario's good, yeah. view, mm. Ezio's view, and even Claudia's view, because they all contacted. And because you can technically walk around um, while the Animus is trying to synchronise the mission, 
you could have three people investigate the animus from three different angles. Just say that premise makes the book mm. amazing. And there's also maybe a reference to Shane oh. in the first one. But I won't say much. You just recommend it. So I need to read you... Heresy. <laughs> right, so I was going to say to Sophia, um, what you described, Sophia, about the novelizations of Two and Brotherhood, I definitely... They're okay, but they're basically retelling what you've already done yeah. in the game. Um, and I didn't find that. Like I said, they're okay. They're not. They're not really telling you anything new. The books in the series that I think that are much more. And I suppose this is obvious, but the ones I think that are much more interesting are the ones that are filling in some of the gaps. So, Forsaken, which tells Haytham's life story, um, the Unity novel, which tells Elise's point of view. Um, heresy which is a standalone but it's fucking brilliant um what else other uh underworld which is again the syndicate spin-off that tells us more about henry green's life those ones i would say if you've got time and if you're interested because some people aren't but if you are those ones are probably worth reading because they flesh out other characters and they give us a lot more depth about the complexity of this world um i'll tell you about la- why why last descendants was on my mind declan so yet today I was re-listening to the last episode of the Sisterhood Speaks podcast and they interviewed Anup Bachman, who was the transmedia manager or transmedia marketing director for Assassin's Creed up until recently. Um, And she was talking about Last Descendants and Matthew Kirby, who wrote the books. Um, And she was also talking about heresy. So that episode, if you're listening to this and you just want to hear a bit more about the the backstory of of how these novels are created and the authors work with with Ubisoft and the writers. That was a really interesting podcast episode to listen to. Um, but yeah, that's what was fresh in my mind. And, and um, Anouk, who was the guest on the show, she said she, they really respected how, um, they were really impressed by how uh, Matthew J. Kirby approached the novels and sort of, like you said, Declan, came up with a new spin on how to present the characters and present the story. So... I think I need to put them on my list. Yeah, I'm definitely going to have to check that. <laughs> the, the other one he did do, and I'm not going to say anything because the whole book is just amazing. He did the Gurman saga for Valhalla. Oh, that one just arrived with me the other day. Now that is a fantastic book for Valhalla. It doesn't flesh out Eivor, but it fleshes out some characters Eivor meets and makes you see them in a different light which blows your mind, in my opinion. Okay. And it's just fantastic. I really think that I'm going off topic with all these books, but... It's all right. (laughs) I've got... I've got got 76 to read, and I've only just finished nine of them in in about three weeks. It's a good read. I mean, uh, my main problem with the the series lately, it's been... has been that I just don't have the time to keep up with everything. But yeah, this year I think yeah. I'll have a few long flights yeah. to be on, so maybe maybe I can catch up on those. Hopefully, yeah. Most most of the novels. I mean, I I only started reading the novels last year. Um, they're not they're not that long. They're sort of a five hour read. If I mean, yeah, they're probably four to five hours to read each one. So you can you can burn through them quickly enough. Um. But like all the other transmedia, geez, there is so much. <laughs> I don't think I'll be expanding don't. into the comics. Just They're great. And, don't. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. I just, oh, I understood. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but no. Gotcha. <laughs> um, Declan, we should probably return just briefly to the script. So uh, where did we get to? Bombshell number five. Have you got any more bombshells about Assassin's Creed 2? No, I just enjoy Assassin's Creed 2. Like... I do love the Ezio collection. No real complaints other than, again, I'm not a fan of parkour and I'm not a fan of the combat because, you know, I like to be engaged with combat. I I can't mentally picture an assassin just standing in a circle of 10 guards parrying. It's just my mind doesn't work. But no other bombshells on that, that. I would recommend anybody replaying it just for a refresher. But... I just think, you know, Ubisoft is way too much on Assassin's Creed 2, you know. I asked 
Twitter today, you know, what games are on the Switch for Assassin's Creed. And funny enough, it's free, remastered, Liberation, Black Flag, and I think someone said Rogue, and yeah. now it's your games. But where's Assassin's Creed 1? Assassin's yeah. Creed 1 has been <laughs> obliterated. The first, legit, not to be rude, but the first remaster should not have been the Ezio Collection. It should have been AC1. But no, it was the Ezio Collection. Then free, well, then Rogue, then free. Oh my and god. It stopped. I've just had a thought. Uh, maybe I shouldn't discuss it because we don't discuss leaks on the show. Okay, <laughs> never mind. I'm so sorry. That's going to be really annoying to everyone listening. Yeah. But I want. Let me just say this. I wonder if there is an AC1 remaster in progress, and it will be released later in the year in connection with something else. That's I, been that would be interesting. Although I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I would be excited for an AC1 remaster. Like a, a remaster, I would take. Even though, you know, you wouldn't... I'm not sure it would sell too well. Because as we were saying before, yeah, the yeah. the older games have not aged too well on some, on some things. Uh, and on the other hand, mm. I feel like a, a remake would completely... It would be a completely different thing. And it could be good, uh, realistically. But I also feel like it could be a complete disaster. <sighs> I just, right, so I'm going to say something that may be unpopular, but I think when you're thinking about these games and the newer games, you've got to have two kind of boxes in your head. You've got the developers who are trying to create the best game, and then you've got the execs at Ubisoft who want to make money. Exactly. And it's the people who are trying to make as much money as possible who are responsible for Redder and microtransactions and Ubisoft Quartz, this new NFT crap. And my greatest fear is that, yes, the developers could take AC1 and make a really beautiful remaster that looks amazing on a 4K telly, works brilliantly on a Switch. And my greatest fear is that the business people will get their hands on it and Redder will appear <laughs> from Damascus. Or all of I'm, I know I'm being a little bit facetious and a little bit silly, but no, that's just yeah. my fear. Or, you know, you'll unlock Altair's throwing knives by grinding NFTs or some other crap. I would cry. Uh, I don't know. I think, I feel like it would be amazing to have that updated version of the game. But, I, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just, I'm you... just very nervous. I think, we, we so we, we did a remake AC1 episode a few weeks ago with, right. with Armin and Kells. And um, I think, Declan, you made this point, which is the valid one, which is, if AC1 does get remastered and, and re-released as a new title, the original title should remain available to buy, play, whatever. So if you don't want any new crap, you can just play the original game as intended. I mean, yeah. I, I still, I mean, I, I don't know if they're going to do it or not, but I have a feeling, just, you know, a gut feeling that if they do... If they do remake the game and not just remaster it, it's going to be a, a good portion of the narrative and even identity of the story is going to get taken away. Because I, I, I hate to say yeah. this, but Ubisoft does not really... There's a, There were different ranges of themes that the, the company was willing to engage with uh, 15 years ago and now. And I don't. F I I have. I just have a, a feeling that a story, or rather the sub contexts of the story in AC One, uh, the executives would not be too happy about that nowadays. That's a very good point. Maybe that's why they will never. I, touch that's it. what I thought. But then again, um, mm. I I, mm. I, just, I just I don't know. <laughs> Oh, I'm so depressed. Now. This what it is. <laughs> we we yeah. Let's uh, we we need to we need to um need to liven this up. Um, I tell you what, we we've been chatting for a long time. We've talked about all aspects of Assassin's Creed Two. We've taken a long diversion talking about novelizations. Um, why don't you sort of sum it up for us, Declan? So what 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 are you? Where are you now in the game? And are you finished? Have you enjoyed your time? 
Uh, I'm nearly finished. And I think it's a daft question to ever enjoy my time because this game has been on my wish list since 2017. And I've not been able to get it since now. So a long wait, finally deserved. And, you know, I'm enjoying it. Would encourage people to try it if you haven't. But I just kind of feel a bit still sad that, you know, they've completely skipped Assassin's Creed 1 and just jumped to Assassin's Creed 2. I get the logistics of a remaster, but it still sucks that Assassin's Creed 1's been left on the weird side when actually Assassin's Creed 1 would have destroyed the franchise if it didn't sell properly. It absolutely would have, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, um, I. I, I'm sorry, I, w I was just thinking of this <laughs> in order to liven it up. Uh, I have... <laughs> I have... <laughs> Do you know what? We could, we could go for one no, of those no, very sad fun. endings, if you like. Like some Sometimes the films you remember are the films with the sad <laughs> ending. So let's do that. <laughs> no, I've just got a small suggestion. Or rather, just a, a little note. Do with it as you will. Uh, for all the non-Italian non speakers... This has happened to me over the course of the years many, many times. And it is very funny, but I just feel the need to warn you guys. If, <laughs> mm. if you go up, like what happened to me quite a few times has been somebody coming up to me and, you know, we start talking and they're like, oh, you know, maybe, I don't know, a scenario like, oh, I, you're from Italy. I I played this very cool game called Assassin's Creed. And I told them, oh yeah, I'm a huge fan of Assassin's Creed 2 as well. And the first thing they do is just look at me straight in the eye and go, ah, yes, fortiti. I just gotta, <laughs> I gotta say, don't do that to anybody. <laughs> that means fuck you. And I know it sounds very funny in Italian, but, you know, going out to people and having that as an icebreaker, not yeah. the best idea. <laughs> See, playing it in English, um, the only words of Italian that Ezio ever says is bene, non bene, and swear yeah. words. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, you've got to be very careful if you're, using, if you're using Assassin's Creed 2 to teach you the Italian language. It's it's a very narrow yeah, not... <laughs> usage. <laughs> maybe start with restaurants. Exactly, and start from Duolingo tickets. and then, you know, maybe move on to Ezio. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Thank you for the tip, yeah. though. That was a pro tip for anyone traveling to Italy. Oh, my word. I can't believe all people actually say that. <laughs> and it is funny for me, but, you know, all the time I'm thinking, man, be careful. You're bound to get punched in the face sooner or, sooner or later. <laughs> Can you imagine arriving in London on your first day, walking up to Britain going, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> thanks, thanks, mate. Yeah, welcome to England. Anyway. <laughs> um, Sophia, what are your sort of closing thoughts? I mean, obviously, you've played this game twice a year for the last however many years. Yeah. You must adore it. <laughs> I uh, I do. Uh, as uh, as Declan said, I I highly recommend anybody who hasn't played it to just give it a go. Um, I I'm gonna say maybe it's not for everybody, especially if it, because it's uh you know an old game. But I will also say that I ha I have never met a single person who has actively disliked the Ezio trilogy. Uh, maybe they didn't like some aspects, but all in all, uh, I've always heard positive things about it so if you haven't played it definitely definitely you know uh see at his journey uh in ac2 all, all the way to uh ac revelations i would say it's worth it yeah and if the ending of revelations doesn't make you cry go and watch embers and uh have some tissues at the ready because yeah, you're gonna bore your eyes out embers. that's not canon no, no. No, we pretend yeah, it doesn't yeah. happen. He lived with forever. the staff and all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, Declan, shall we uh, close the show? Yeah, I'm just going to reminisce how I feel like a monster now. Not at all. Not at all. listen. Uh, you you heard me. I didn't really use the parkour. I was terrible at. <laughs> Sophia thinks I'm mad, and I was playing on nightmare difficulty because I never did a single counter kill. I never used throwing knives. But you know, that's just me being a muppet. So you're not the only one. But I, like you two both said, I really, really enjoyed um, all of these. I've enjoyed all of the games in the franchise, and I really enjoyed the early games. I'd obviously play them a lot differently now, um, but I loved it. It was great. 
Well, I may be the monster who never actually cried at Embers or the Okay, end that's too many bombs. Just get out. <laughs> just get out, please. What? <laughs> what? It's just, I just can't. Like, just put it out there on the tent for a close up. My body just naturally can't cry at sad things. No, I'm, fair enough. Fair well, enough. Just, just tough, I, mate. Yeah. I can't even cry at Titanic, and I've seen it eight times. <laughs> nah. That's fair. But my partner watches Toy Story 3, she cries, and I'm like, it's all right, there's a fourth movie, so you know it's all going to end well. <laughs> <laughs> what are you all crying right. for? You know, I've got a mission film. now. I need to find some proper tearjerkers to see where you crack. <laughs> I'm stoned. I crack nowhere. <laughs> I tell you what, Declan. Before you close the show, we should. Um, Sophie, um, so I've been watching your your streams recently. Um, you've been playing Origins. Have I completely imagined it, or were you streaming AC two recently? Uh, I, oof. I, I, I never actually streamed AC two. Uh, surprisingly mm-hmm. enough. Okay, I'm getting mixed up with someone <laughs> else. Then I'm sorry. <laughs> I definitely I enjoyed your Origins uh, you. stream recently. They were great. I really enjoy Origins, to be honest. It's God, such a good game. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, where where can we find you on the internet if people who have listened to this show want to? I mean, if they, you? for whatever reason, uh, feel like uh, hearing more of this, I stream on Twitch. My my <clears throat> sorry, my handle is Sophia A sixteen, uh, and actually, you can find me with that name on Twitch, Instagram, Twitter, uh, probably around the internet somewhere. Uh, I forget. But yeah, uh, I stream, I do illustrations, I ramble a lot, uh, as you can see, and that's it. <laughs> All good. I've seen some of you, or you've shared some of your artwork recently, and uh, oh. Thank you. I chef's really kiss. It. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me. This was uh, This was really fun to do. Oh, it's been great. And thank you for agreeing to to, to meet with us and, and speak on fairly short. We normally plan a bit further in advance. And uh, let's say not through no fault of anyone except me and Declan, we, we kind of messed up <laughs> our calendar a little bit. And at the end of last week, we, we suddenly realized, oh, damn, we do not Oops. really have an episode planned. And so thank you for agreeing to join with us uh, on uh, fairly short notice. And we've been speaking for nearly Oops. two hours. Oh, my <laughs> word. Right. <laughs> Declan, close the show, my friend. Before I close, I am going to say that it was not my fault we messed up. I'm blaming Google Drive. It's always Google's Absolutely. computer's fault. A good word Computer <laughs> always blames his tools. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so thank you again, Sophia, for joining. You know, and it's been great to talk about Sasuke too, because the biggest complaint I've had about doing the podcast myself is I can't give you guys accurate knowledge on games I have not played for years. But now I have accurate knowledge for all Assassin's Creed games. So I could be evil with what I say, and if you have survived my bombshells, I am truly sorry. <laughs> but I uh, thank you all for joining, and we shall so- you can. Yeah, uh, not fun time now. Yeah, I'm coming down. With my partner's cold. If you want like to make any comments about the Etsy collection, and if you are playing on Switch, please reach out to Twitter at AC Let's Talk and at James to the Quid, or you can email me at Assassin's Creed Let's Talk at gmail.com. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you all next week. See you soon.